Warm greetings. Welcome to Wednesdays for Water. We are a citizens collective aiming to walk and talk water. We try to meet every week and connect people with various water worries and wisdoms. And in the process, we wish to curate future water warriors. The way we talk about trivial things for hours, water too needs walking and talking to address the rising water distresses. The way Wednesdays for Water is conceptualized as a prime time show, uh, it wishes to make water everybody's business. The idea of the series was conceptualized in August 2020 and by the end of the year, the team and the structure was pretty much in shape. We started in Aug April 2021 with Dr. Rajendra Singhji's inaugural speech. Uh, we wish to bring science and society together and therefore we try to bring in in every session either a policymaker or practitioner and a researcher or academician. We also think that future generation is crucial and therefore they have presence in each session. We are going stronger with every week now with session on either quiz, couple of weeks of hard talks and a week of soft session of art and music. There is a simple structure for each session of quiz, hard session and soft session which are moderated by the core team member. Here is a glimpse of what we call as hard sessions and soft sessions. So, uh, good evening everyone uh, to, and welcome you all to another exciting session on water management in smart cities. Um, so, uh, we are uh, having a couple of webinars being conducted every Wednesdays, and this is one such webinar where uh, we are foc our focus. Uh, we have been focusing on different sectors uh, this this week and. With me, um, the us, uh, we have Mr. Tushar Bose, uh, associate professor from uh, SET uh, University, CEPT. And we have uh, Hari Dilip Kumar, who's a sustainability problem solver from Salt Sustain. And uh, we have our discussant, uh, Mr. Ella Mohil, um, who is part of the Dhan Foundation and will also discuss his case uh, of uh, urban water rejuvenation. So um, smart cities, as we uh, talk about, has been in our trend uh, probably back in 2015 when uh, it just came out, out of the boom, you know, saying that things get smarter and um, and th that's when the technology was being combined with uh, the natural urban uh, resources like energy, uh, water, uh, and uh, solid waste management, uh, sewage treatment, effluent management. So there are a couple of uh, couple of things that come along the way when you talk of smart cities. But uh, water management, it's like you know, it plays a pivotal role, and it's like it takes the top of everything. Because uh, uh, because it's like uh, what the when you have water in a city and you know it's 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 good that you know people can survive with that and uh, uh, today we had a session on uh, uh, something called as ICC as a service model that's the integrated command control center by uh, uh, conducted by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs so I happen to be a part of that discussion also and they made a very nice point on you know um, sensing we have to sense the data to make sense of the data. So it, it's a very deep meaning, but it says that uh, when you have a smart city, it means you're having real-time data. So we have to equip ourselves to make good decision-making. And uh, I'm sure we have expert panel with us who will be guiding us and letting us know on uh, what each of us, uh, each, uh, on each academia front, on industrial front, and on community front. So uh, welcome, uh, welcome speakers. Uh, let me take this um, opportunity to uh, first uh, introduce um, Bose. Um, Tushar, uh, Tushar Bose is an associate professor at the Faculty of Technology from CEPT University. He has over 12 years of experience in teaching, research, and consultancy and has been a part of various national and international development agencies. His research areas of uh, areas are environmental impact assessment, environmental modeling, urban sanitation, and sustainable infrastructure development. So, uh, welcome, uh, Tushar. Uh, we would like you uh, to take the uh, to share your screen and share your thoughts. On it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, let me just start. Uh, see, uh, you know, everyone 
think starts with his or her own definition of smart. Uh, for me, uh, you know, this also has been a very superfluous word in the sense that uh, does smart only mean data? Or what exactly are we talking about? Are we talking about data as smart cities or are we talking about our intellect, intellectual capacity of being smart and collecting data or analyzing data? Uh, so I'll start with what is the problem and why we need to talk about it and what I see, I, at least I perceive as a solution to this problem. Just one second. So my slides are not changing. Okay. Okay. So it, this changed. Okay. So the first problem at hand is urbanization. So we know cities, you know, are continuously expanding, especially in India. Uh, the trends of urbanization as per the UN uh, established that our population is uh, going to double by 2050. So that is one. Also, it's not only the population which is doubling, but the size of cities. So one is the density and the population increase. The other is the built up area increase. And you know, there's a report uh, on land use change for 44 cities, which suggests that, you know, 19 from 19% uh, built up in 1991, we are almost at 40 percent built up in 2017 for these 40 cities at the same time two other things are happening the urban greens are decreasing so from almost 13 percent it's less than 10 percent in urban open spaces from close to 11 percent they are close to eight percent now so we see that the population is you know predicted to increase at the same time uh, the land use or uh, the urbanization or expansion of urban uh, urban areas is also going to happen with increase in built up and decrease in green spaces. So this is what is challenging and which has already happened. The other major issue is climate change and nobody can neglect this issue. So, you know, uh, there are two studies, especially on this, uh, on this. So apart from the IPCC reports, especially for the Indian subcontinent, there are two studies. One is uh, by uh, IIT Mumbai. Uh, which says that uh, there will be a three, so there has been already a threefold increase in the widespread extreme. So what they talk about is it's not only the nature of extreme. So it's not only extreme rainfall, which is coming, but the region covered by this rainfall is also increasing. So they are also talking about a special increase in the phenomena of extreme rainfall and which has been observed from 1950 to 19, uh, 2015 data. So there'll be a three, four, uh, threefold increase in flooding. So one, cities are going to face the brunt of climate change. So there's urbanization as, uh, and then there is climate change, especially flooding. But flood is not the only problem for our cities because we would have seen that, you know, uh, so Chennai especially, uh, we read reports that, you know, uh, so right now it will be probably flooding uh, close to summer. There'll be, you know, almost reports of this going to a uh, day zero. So city almost reaching to day zero because of lack of availability of water. So it's not one problem which we are facing in our cities. Uh, there are two. So one is when uh, there is rain, it's in plenty. And when there is none, it's a drought like a situ like situation. So we are almost talking about reaching day zero. Again, this is a case study. There's this is a research paper published by IIT Gandhinagar, which says that uh, in 21st century, so in, at the till the end of 21st century, uh, flash droughts, which is the loss of moisture in soil, will increase by sevenfold uh, by the end of century. So we cities uh, face this double whammy. So there is flooding. There is also lack of water in some seasons, and you know access in some. And plus urbanization. So there's a three prong challenge which we are looking at. Uh, also, if we talk about India per se, we are the largest users of groundwater. And I know this in Ahmedabad, you know, groundwater situation keeps on getting worse uh, from this thing from every year, especially in the outskirts where we have act only groundwater to, uh, you know, for our drinking purposes. Uh, what it says, uh, so this is again a uh, report of Niti Ayog, which says, you know, uh, in the next 20 years, 60% of our aquifers will be in critical condition. So as you can see the map, a lot of the area already looks red. So it's already in extremely critical situation. But uh, by tw in next 20 years, 60% uh, of this will be in critical. Also, 85% of our groundwater is dependent, 85% uh, of our drinking water is dependent on groundwater. So while water is an issue, 
we see there's a plenty there's lack also we are we only have limited resource of groundwater that also we are exploiting so the question is what is smart how do you deal with this problem of uh, lack of water in some seasons a lot of water in some uh, seasons and can we design or can we plan our cities for being sensitive to water so that would be the smart development for me and it's not like we are talking about uh, so this concept is new or something which uh, you know is my discovery we've seen cities in especially singapore you know uh, working on its development plan with uh, green and blue at center so what we see unlike indian cities if you look at the map of singapore from 18 uh, 1986 to 2007 the greens increased from 36% to 47% so there's an increase in green they have a program called active beautiful clean waters so abc program which you can search and the entire planning uh, because singapore you know one of the issues for the city is uh, they had to import water and you know there it was at the end a matter of national security or water security and therefore they wanted to have their own water resource so the area of singapore would be closely that of amdabad uh so it's the city of what we know however almost 50% of the area is green unlike uh, our city and the entire city is built on uh, the entire city planning is based on catchment areas for water so whatever water body is there the catchment area has to be there uh while we look at singapore and we know there has been a successful story uh uh on nature we'll also i'll take a um, one minute to explain what is nature based solution and what can be the benefit i'm sure everybody knows this uh but because we are defining it here so nature based solutions uh are any solution uh, which takes nature as the center and tries to look at any societal benefit so it can be a societal benefit of water security it can be uh, the societal benefit of food security health solution Uh, uh disaster mitigation or climate change so in each of these areas if we can plan something our cities can uh, plan around water so if we just plan around water we will be dealing with you know the disaster risk will be dealing with uh, climate change to a, to an extent also will be dealing with water security for the city so that's why planning around water and considering na- uh, and keeping nature at the center and planning around water is essential with that i'll take you through one case which mansi uh, of course very aware of so in amdavad we started with interlinking of lakes and you know uh, in the last couple of years we got a chance to look at this case in detail and this started in 2005 so it's not like you know only singapore is trying to look at water and plan uh, with water at center indian cities have also come out with uh, you know indigenous solutions for looking at some uh, so tackling the uh, problem of water in cities samdabad so came out with a problem of uh, uh, you know uh, samdabad so was facing floods 2002 uh, 3 uh, was major flooding in amdabad and 2005 the city decided that you know it is very very expensive to get all the water through pipelines to the sabarmati river so this here is the map of amdabad so this is amdabad and the river is at the center so it was decided it's very expensive to lay pipelines and get everything to the river rather what amdavad did is it based uh, the entire uh, storm water management on two systems two interlinking systems so one is this phase one which took the water here so this is here which took the interconnected the lakes so water would go from one lake to the another so water whatever excess water was collected will flow from one lake to the another and through a system of lake it will get discharged into the river the second phase was uh, again the second phase was implemented which was around 11 lake it's again interconnected but they flow to another canal called gota godavari canal uh, this is just what were the components of the project so phase one was what happened inside the lake so there was extension of roads so all along the so you demarcated the boundary of lake so that was the first thing uh, you did uh to prevent encroachment remove any encroachment which was there uh put a percolation well so so that whatever excess water is collected also becomes ground water through the percolation well desilted the water body to get uh, excess capacity of the tank uh 
also connected the stormwater inlet uh, of the region, so nearby area to the lake. So this was the stage one, which was within the lake. And also what was done was uh, around the lake, there was green spaces. Uh, so there was a first inlet and outlet for uh, the excess water, which will come from a lake behind to the lake and excess water, which will flow out. Uh, there were also recreational spaces provided, and these are some of the pictures of what happened uh, to the lake devil interlinking right now. Uh, so this is these are some of the gardens, lake gardens, as you can see. This is uh, lake at border of this, the garden around it, and Mastapur Lake. Uh, we also looked at, you know, from 2005 to 2020, in last 15 years, what are the impacts? Now, see. In no way I'm claiming that this is the best way of doing things. In fact, when I come to the last slide, I'll tell you what are the problems. But uh, we'll talk about what were the what some of the benefits were of the project. So one of the best things was so it started with interlinking of around 22 lakes when it started in 2005. Uh, ultimately, because of some uh, judicial or boundary change, 13 lakes could uh, inter get interlinked which provided a total capacity of 3 million cubic meters of water. So, you know, people dealing with water and stormwater will tell you that, you know, if you increase the storage capacity of water, the peak of the storm, so you delay the peak, at the same time, the intensity of the peak also decreases. So that provides some sort of flood resilience. In fact, we also looked at the map of flood points of Ahmedabad and juxtaposed them with uh, the interlinking of lakes and we see that you know uh, wherever the interlinks are not working or uh, were not done you still see uh, flooding otherwise in the area where the interlinks are working properly and the lake is connected to the catchment the, inter uh, the flooding has in fact decreased we also compared two groundwater monitoring station one around an interlinking of uh, lake and one which was away and we found out that you know wherever the interlinking was happening at the least what had happened is the groundwater level remained same in spite of withdrawals or it had in fact improved in certain certain areas compared to the lakes which had no groundwater no uh, interlinking or percolation wells in fact in the lakes which did not, did not have percolation wells this in fact groundwater decreased uh, also one of the best things was uh, the area around the lake became gardens and you know at present 10 percent of the gardens this is the amc's data are uh, these lake gardens so 10 percent of the city open green spaces are because of these interlinking projects uh, so this is the socio-economic impact of green spaces now the key takeaway okay, so this is my last slide and end, end with this one of the biggest takeaway was when you plan an open space and why only 13 lakes uh, were interlinked instead of 22 is while the project was planned as such for uh, uh, so any such project of blue or green nature or water sensitive design has to be first done at the city level the second most important thing is policy and regulation see what happened in case of Ahmedabad is uh, the project started uh, with uh, amc at the or Ahmedabad municipal corporation at the center in between in 2008 or something uh, the boundaries of the city changed and the lakes uh, which were done by order and the urban development authority now were handed to amc which had no idea of the project and therefore uh, now in 2018 you see the revival of the project but in between it was lost completely and therefore could not be completed also uh, while amc you know Ahmedabad has these pp mechanisms and everything uh, we as researchers should explore uh, environmental uh, cost benefit analysis and risk related UIs uh, for you know making them more financially viable. The major issues with some of these projects is also uh, mobilizing resources for maintenance. How do you sustain these projects? While AMC had uh, you know contracts with the Amul Garden, the Amul and this thing, so we call them Amul Gardens. But there has to be a strategy for uh, mobilizing resources for uh, operation and maintenance. And last or second last but not the least, technology. So in India, we still are exploring uh, low impact development strategies like bioswales. And you know, there are papers which say this is good, probably might lead to more mosquito breeding and uh, with dengue, uh, dengue and this, uh, you know, 
uh, chicken gunia already a problem do you want to have something which you know has open water there so we have to look at what technology and so biosphere is one the then you know rain gardens and what technology do we think is more suitable for our area and how do we optimize such technology and finally is research uh, no, research knowledge and capacity one of the major things is most of the research you see on low impact development uh, the data for for example data for green roof and how much uh, rain can be uh, or or storm water can be reduced because of green roofs uh, all data and research comes from uh, the western data where the rainfall patterns are different therefore uh, the efficiency of these is quite different also most of the the uh, optimization algorithms which you see where exactly to place these green roofs or biospheres or uh, rain gardens most of the optimization algorithms also have been only tested for foreign uh, countries we have not tested it, or at least i have not seen any literature wherein we have uh, tested uh, any optimization algorithm for our case so that is would be my way forward so my answer to the first question which is uh, for smart city what does it mean to uh, what does water mean to a smart city is looking back not at data but looking at water designing our cities based on just water because that is how we started developing so that is from my side thank you thank you everyone thank you so much tushar and just and just yes. sorry i forgot to add so in the link here you can uh, so the case study i mentioned it was uh, brief but you can uh, download the entire case study from here uh, it is also knowledge material in the sense you can take it to the class and you know uh, so it basically uh, doesn't take a stand and you know class can debate on whether this is the right way of development or not yeah thank you thank you so much tushar uh you actually gave a very nice perspective that smart cities is not only about data that's pretty true because we have city operations and city analytics and that's how you differentiate it and you started on talking about lakes and uh, lakes are like the breathing hubs of uh, this of any city because that's the space where you know uh, you know that that's that's the place where you know the entire city thrives because uh, city must be placed somewhere in deep in deep in center of the thing not in the coastline so maybe lakes are so important and connecting such lakes and you explained about the active beautiful uh, clean water system in singapore also the abc thing so that was also very intuitive thank you so much uh for that wonderful presentation we shall take up the questions at the end um so let's now move on to our next speaker uh mr hari uh so um hari has been um part um so i'll just give you a brief introduction what hari so um he is an engineer by training and has a decade uh, of uh, rich and varied experience in sustainability and social impact and he's been worked in globally recognized projects on off grid energy and water in industry agriculture and food security Uh, Hari uh, co-founded Fluxgen and later worked with Micro Energy International and Solshare, and he's researched on system issues at the Public Affairs Center. Uh, it's a non-profit think tank uh, which is focused on SDGs in the Indian context, and also is now working with non-profits and startups addressing the sustainable challenges through uh, re uh, through a recently founded company called as the Sustainability Problem Solver. so uh, welcome hari on to the uh, uh, welcome aboard i'd say so on to you you can share yours thank you thank you so uh, are you able to see my screen yes okay 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 so uh, so so how much time do i get vasanta shall i aim for 12 minutes 10 yes, minutes that will be good yeah okay 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 so the first thing i want to say is that i don't know anything except that questions are really the most important thing for me i mean there's a loop of questions and answers of course but so this presentation might be a little different like we had a presentation by a very eminent expert in uh, water just just now and but my presentation is a little different because it's more about a thought process and when i think of water data and indian smart cities what do i think of so i want to leave you with questions and uh you know for some of you the questions might be trivial but for me as somebody who's implementing this stuff talking to different kinds of groups where everybody in the room is an expert in a different field these questions are on my mind right now okay so that being said let's get into it 
So the first question which I would have, so I'm going to stick in the intersection of water data and smart cities, right? Is what are the drivers of creating this water data, right? Like there must be some reason for people to invest in sensors and collect all that data and go to the trouble of doing it, right? More than just doing, there must be some outcome they're looking for or some advantage or some pressure which is driving them. So some of the things which I think might answer this question could be things like, uh, you know, it's become too expensive for uh, corporates to be unsustainable because of pressure from investors, consumers, and government. And even though most corporates might not care twice about this, you can see early signals that investors, corporates, and government are looking much closer at how corporates engage with the environment through things like for example, business responsibility and sustainability reporting, which is going to become mandatory soon in India, the carbon disclosure project, which includes water metrics as well, uh, you know, the central groundwater authority rules, which uh, say that you have to start measuring how much groundwater is there. So, you know, the way in which society views uh, the use and extraction use and uh, reuse of water is changing because of certain drivers, including climate change, which has in fact been identified as a risk to the financial system, the global financial system. So there are deep drivers behind this, which we need to understand. It's not just to, you know, like pedal IoT sensors, I think. Okay, so let's keep this question. There may be some other reasons which I haven't mentioned as well. Let's say that all this data is available, right? In, smart, in a smart city. So I agree with Professor Tushar that you know, it's not easy to define a smart city. Uh, and there is no one definition of a smart city. So you can choose whatever definition you want to. So if you go to the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs website, they will actually put a line there saying there is no definition of one definition of a smart city. So it's up to us to imagine it. And I came across a very interesting definition today, which was that a smart city is something which creates sustainable development outcomes, right? That's a very compact definition, which engages water data as part of how it does that. It's not about the data per se. So that being said, how does this data actually create the value, right? And just putting my engineering hat on, I know there are several engineers around here. It's not just the data itself, right? We can't go around magically converting data into better water outcomes, right? So there must be something which happens to it. So are there computer models which are built is there machine learning which helps? Uh, you might think that it's overrated, but you know anybody who's in sustainability, for example, will know about limits to growth, which was a study predicting the collapse of business as usual uh, in the mid 21st century using computer modeling and systems thinking. So it's very, very important to engage this approach despite uh, you know, the overuse of it in certain senses. So who does this create? Who does this, who do these models create value for? And finally, how, how can we collaborate in new ways in order to create and share this value? So I'm using value in a broader sense, obviously, than the amount of money I can make out of it. I hope everybody here also agrees by now that we need to be measuring value in a different way, in a more multidimensional way. So I'll leave it there for you to think about. So the next set of questions uh, which I would have uh, you know, I can also talk about some of the answers which, uh, you know, I'm coming up with along with many other working groups and project efforts and so on and so forth. Uh, for example, on, on Friday, uh, if you want to sit in on the design process, the open design process of something called a water digital twin, you can join me at the IET panel discussion on the same thing. The idea is to uh, employ hydrological modeling as well as other kinds of machine learning on top of all kinds of data, much of which is from water sensors, in order to be able to simulate water systems and therefore manage them in real time and predictively. So there's a huge uh, you know, value creation from that, but something much more concrete and down to earth could be, uh, you know, can we start measuring how much water is getting consumed and start planning water security on the basis of that so that we don't have a tanker maf mafia, for example. Could there be an Uber of water for industries or for RWAs, which breaks the tanker mafia in the same way that the regular Uber broke the auto driver mafia, at least in Bangalore, so on and so forth. So there are a bunch of these use cases, right? 
Um, so that being said, uh, there have been, you know, like when you talk about water, you know, I was told before starting this discussion that we, uh, there are, inclusion is very important for water and there are too many quote unquote manuals uh, discussing water, basically panels of all men. And this is very true, especially since in an Indian household, in a rural household or in a, you know, low income household, it's usually the woman who has to go through uh, like a very unsecured pathways and go for several hours and fetch that water uh, while but for the whole family. And, and, you know, so there are so many issues of uh, hidden costs associated, which are gender biased, right? And therefore, anybody who is serious about water will know already much better than me that inclusion, gender, and equity are inseparable from water issues, right? Unfortunately, you know, uh, not just in water, but in other aspects like food security or sovereignty and so many other things, when technological approaches have been applied uh, in a, let's say, imperfect manner or not well thought out manner, in my humble opinion, in some cases, it has led to more exclusion. And uh, there is literature which shows, for example, that people logging into certain uh, identification systems to get their rations or whatever, because their fingerprints rubbed off, because they were laborers, were not able to access those systems, right? So we don't want technology to create exclusion. So how do we mitigate this? And what I'm proposing is that we use methodologies like human-centered design, participatory methods. And uh, if I may say so, I think you know all IAS officers should be trained in human-centered design if they're not already getting that training, uh, because they have to take, take these decisions, right? And empathy is so important. The final point which I'd like to make here is that the metrics become super important. And there is actually a whole uh, menu of metrics you can choose from. And for me, actually, the problem is selecting down from those and choosing the right weighted average of these metrics to figure out on a decentralized, maybe granular level, how sustainable water, water actually is. And I can unpack that in more detail, but it basically means, uh, I mean, I think it's clear what it means. It corresponds to something called the PPP, for example, which is the planet profit and people, uh, which is an element of the sustainable development, which has been underutilized and has not been engaged uh, sufficiently in my opinion. But you know, using computer-based systems, it might be possible to do this like, much better. So uh, yeah, so this is my uh, second to last slide. So th these are just questions on how do you use uh, data and technology and database technologies to break silos right? and create multi-stakeholder data, data sharing. Uh, many of the problems which we see or the outcomes which we see will be repeated if the same thinking creates the same governance structures which led to these problems. And so if you want to have different outcomes, then maybe you need to change the way in which institutions interact. Uh, for example, if you know, like an industry is sucking up water somewhere, then somebody who's uh, you know, concerned with the water security of communities nearby should factor it in into the cost of water extraction for the industry, something like this, right? So there are cost benefits which have to be distributed across different heterogeneous parties, right? And technology can enable this. In fact, there is specific digital infrastructure in the smart cities for this. For example, the India Urban Data Exchange, whose stated mission is to unleash the power of data for the public good, right? And once you get into those aspects of sharing data, you have to then ask the question, how can you do this in a secure and private way? Because you know, if we want to create an Uber of data, but it's leaking data to somebody who can then misuse it, then it is a serious concern which also needs to be mitigated, right? So the intention is to break the silos, but to do it safely enough so that, uh, you know, in the presence of data sharing and inferencing amplified by machines, uh, it can still happen safely. And uh, I can say that, you know, there is uh, also efforts towards this happening, okay? So finally, I just want to leave you with my uh, outstanding question in this particular intersection, which is 
what is an appropriate demonstrator platform which factors in all the questions which I just put down uh, and how can we move towards that? And one possible candidate is, uh, you know, might emerge from a discussion on Friday, which uh, if you are interested, I can, I can also share the link. Danesh is also part of that, that panel, by the way, Danesh from Plaxi. So, and Vasanta as well, I forgot to say. So, uh, so, so thank you, thank you so much. And, and, and uh, this is all I have to say. So uh, you can also, if you want to get in touch or you can, you can contact me and if you contact me on LinkedIn, then it's helpful if you just mention where we might have encountered each other. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hari. Uh, so I must say the presentation was uh, in a very different tinge of asking, uh, giving answers by uh, making us put all the thinking hats by giving a lot of questions, you know, so what about this, what about this, what about this? So it, it has given a very nice tinge to this uh, entire uh, session today. Thanks for that. So uh, definitely data is from technology and technology is a path to achieve social impact. So social uh, water as a, you know, water as a resource has both social value as well as monetary value, right? So uh, the more you consume water, the more you pay for it. At the same time, uh, I mean, there's a lot of social equity. I mean, water equity issues also that's happening. So uh, today I happen to uh, go in for a session, uh, like I'd already mentioned before. Uh, uh, this was a session by uh, the Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs, where uh, they talked about the ICCC. So IEEE, that's the Integrated Command Control Center as a service model. And uh, uh, the Joint Secretary and the Mission Director of Smart Cities, Mr. Kunal Kapoor, uh, Kunal Kumar, sorry, uh, he had mentioned that, he had mentioned one important point that uh, he was mentioning the importance of data and how it's being used also. So he said that 100 years ago in US, they started off on a understanding what are numbers, what are data. However, that time we weren't in a situation to understand, we weren't in a situation to think even on that lines. So now is the time when we are like kind of industrialized and developed and we are trying to get our more day, uh, get, trying to get more uh, tech on hand. And that's how we've been able to uh, get into this field of IoT, AI and getting data on field. So one concept that was discussed today was on a state urban analytics center that is coming as a SUAC that's already, uh, it's in the proposal stage. And so uh, talking about this SUAC, uh, there is one more, uh, you know, correlation that I'd like to suggest. So for example, if you talk about human body and uh, humans, uh, so uh, earlier days, you know, we, we used to say that, you know, if a person is dull, you say maybe the person is weak and all, but now we say, okay, let's go and check the blood report and we'll say, okay, the hemoglobin is 12, the hemoglobin is eight. So we, we understand it. So, uh, so it's, it's, it's a very, very, very delicate and a very nice balance of how we quantify water and how we understand it. Uh, and we realize the socialness, the social impact of water through quantifying it and how, because only if we measure, we can manage it better. So that's what, what even Fluxion holds to it. So, um, so it, it was wonderful. Thanks for highlighting even the uh, environmental cost benefit analysis that Tushar also spoke about. Hari also, you, all, you had also spoken about that. So uh, wonderful on that. Thank you so much, Hari, for your presentation. Um, Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, so let's now uh, then go on to uh, Ila Mohin. Yes, thank you so much for sharing. Um, so let me just give a brief introduction about Ila Mohil and the work that he has been doing. So uh, he is a part of uh, Dhan Foundation. Uh, he's a part of the Center for Urban Water Resources uh, from Dhan Vyalagam uh, Tank Foundation. And they have a sectoral focus on water management in urban and semi-urban environments with the vision of urban water security. It works with the mission of building people institutions to enable urban citizens for ecologically balanced development. They have made, uh, you know, enabled local communities and rejuvenated nearly 17 water bodies in Madurai. It's in Tamil Nadu. And, uh, uh, and he's been uh, interacting, it, it, it's, it's serving as a platform for young minds. Uh, he's also having a lot of interns, fellows and volunteers, you know, working with him in this field. So on to you, Ella Muhil, uh, you can uh, discuss the case that you have been uh, doing and you can also pose your questions to the speaker. Thank you, ma'am. So uh, is it audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. So let me share some of our experience in the rejuvenation of water bodies and uh, Yeah. So Madurai is a, a city of tanks, like uh, 
it is generated like all the villages in the madurai and uh, names of the villages are with the suffix of the water bodies that we call eri kulam kundu endal and urani and uh, these water bodies were established much before 17th century and uh, we have solid uh, archaeological evidence for the same and uh, over past four decades like uh, the urban sprawl has been increased five times and the city has also lost 23 percentage of the water bodies in its uh, city area and through our pilaham program uh, we have regenerated around 17 water bodies in past mm -hmm. three years uh, and uh, like basically how this uh, water bodies existed for past uh, 13th century that is the village economy and the well-being of the community were centering with the water bodies and though there was not any like the equity was not ensured but again it remained as an open resource and uh, over a period there was an evolution of socio-cultural elements that safeguarded these water commons and uh, basically like we also talk about the investing in rehabilitation of these water commons before getting into it i just So, like when we talk about the urbanization, then how we moved from these water commons that especially the communities who are water centric, they turned the process of urbanization as a people who are in the vicinity of the water bodies. And uh, due to that process, then either they go as a free ride, the water commons becomes the free ride, or either it becomes as a another land use. They, they either convert it into a public infrastructure like courts, some other government buildings, bus stands. And etc. And when it comes to the individual encroachments, then it comes to the collective encroachment by all the communities, especially considering they are ad hoc structures like septic tanks and boundary walls or some farms. When it comes to individuals, then it depends upon the influence of the individuals to encroach. So, like when we invest, we have two methods: this direct investment where we engage the communities, where the funding is rooted through the community institutions. And the community also contribute for the regeneration process and in this process we could feel we could also document the development of the sense of trusteeship among the community and in other model where the direct investment goes where the government and the charitable uh, donors and corporates invest directly on the regeneration process where there is a divide of the community trusteeship on these water bodies so basically in our gans model like we work with the community and uh, we enable the community to invest on the water bodies and also we generate the water bodies and uh, maintain the soup. So when it goes to urban, then we have to search for the community and who are the real community. Because when there is no direct uh, users of the water bodies, then we have to find the users. So some of the experiences, like one is like, we have many pockets of rural inside the urban fabrics. So there we have the uh, community, who are traditional community who have the memory of the water commons. So wherever we uh, such cases are uh, possible, then the restoration itself will regenerate or restore the last cultural uh, elements in the community, especially with the water commons. So here, the restoration process, even the community is involved in the planning process and they invest 15 to 30 percentage of the total uh, restoration uh, cost. And also they will be involved, uh, they will be leading the implementation process. And since most of these communities are marginalized communities, uh, they have their associations uh, as their part of the association. It improves their consultative nature and also negotiation capacities and also in conflict management to a certain level. But the sense of trusteeship and the stewardship is very strong post the regeneration. And uh, one of the examples is like we have restored the irrigation tank where 300 landless families were practicing tank bed cultivation inside the irrigation tank in the dry seasons using the soil moisture. They used to go for the vegetable crops and uh, they have cultivated millions and vegetables. But uh, like for pa past 30 years, they have lost this particular activity. And when uh, it was completely uh, dropped, the complete tank was invaded by gross office. And when we restored this particular tank with the landless people, again, 100 families were repracticing the same tank bed cultivation and they started doing bitter guard for their own benefits. And uh, the equity was maintained by the community itself. They formed uh, proper uh, regulations and norms. And they strongly negotiated with the public works department to practice tank bed cultivation as uh, they are used for tracks. 
and also they invest their labor in uh, doing the process of in the uncultivated area and when we go to the transition places where there is a new uh, urban communities and the traditional communities then uh, there is a loss of memory on the water body and there is a conflict between the new and the traditional communities and uh, most of these research and planning process are influenced either by the traditional or the new uh, urban communities and when it comes to re uh, restoration process investments it ranges from 5 to 10 percent is not more than that and even that is very difficult and uh, in the implementation also it is not community led implementation process it is just community participatory and uh, the consultation and negotiation even the conflict management is very weak and the conflict between the new and traditional communities are very strong and it is very difficult to resolve it and maximum they go to the judiciary system for getting the for resolving their conflicts and uh, the justice and stewardship again depends upon the individual and not about the collective conscious and the cultural element is completely absent in this type of cases so one of the cases like selenary urani so it's a pond so in this particular pond has a hydrological connectivity with the irrigation tank system from where it gets the feed and uh, this hydrological connect also associates the local connectivity between the uh, new and the traditional communities and then comes the conflict between the communities in sharing the water and finally the court ordered to use the water like share the water and finally they are sharing the water and uh, there is also the water water commons which was restored was not open to all there is again a selective openness whom to open whom not to open whom to access who not access so that is again driven by a group of people or a individual and when it comes to the matured or uh, urban locations who have already faced the water insecurity in the urban fabrics then uh, also the communities have acquired some of the cultural commons there is a social norms and cultural norms that can be well utilized for restoration and uh, preservation of these water bodies so here the communities are very much involved in the collective com community planning process in rejuvenation and uh, the investment ranges from 10 to 15 percentage and there is a 100 percent investment in uh, after uh, like uh, after restoration especially in operational maintenance and uh, the implementation is led by uh, the community they monitor each and every day process they ev evaluate it whether it's a profit or loss and they drive the whole rejuvenation process and uh, the consultation and negotiation capabilities are uh, depends upon the community and maximum it is uh, comparatively higher than any other communities and uh, the sense of trusteeship is also very strong and here the cultural elements are the tribe otherwise they create the new practices which can bring more people into it so one of the example is like uh, suravali med once it was a irrigation tank that was irrigating 30 acres of uh, cultivable land and later it was turned into a dumping site and uh, the, it was located in the uh, harvepatti location which is the first planned township in madurai and uh, yeah, a group of youngsters in 1974 established a gym, atlas gym it uh, by for the for building more wrestlers in that location and uh, that particular practice have been built lot of values and ethics among them and when we went for restoration in 2020 the same group of uh, youngsters who are now in 60s they formed their association and they expressed all their cultural elements to the community and uh, it was very much helpful for the community also to learn how uh, a collective decision can be done and collective decision can be done and it serves as an example and they have recently got an award from the district collector also so the, the irrigation tank which turned into a dumping yard has been converted into a recreational space especially they created a recreational park for women and children and a walking track for women which is uh, making it more safe and also more accessible for the community and they are also practicing a monthly walk uh to bring more children women and also youngsters into this particular commons and create the relationship between them and uh, when, there are also some uh, pockets where it is completely unnoticed urban where the water bodies are uh, completely ignored or even not identified by the uh, government and uh, in these cases the research and activity brings back the traditional community who are far away from the location and uh, they connect themselves post restoration and also they involve themselves in the later uh, restoration or regeneration processes so one example is like uh, nilavurani which was completely not in the yeah. data of the government it was identified and uh, 
so it's restored by dan foundation with the help of the uh, corporate social responsibility funding and the when we started the re- when we uh, were trying to promote the association there was no any community near me and when we started the restoration by when we desilted the uh, we started to desil the particular uh, urani then the local community who are far away mostly like 1.2 1.5 1. km away from the particular pond they came towards it they formed their association and they involved completely in all the restoration activities and in the phase 2 interventions they led the particular restoration activities and uh, they also started to practice the cultural festivals which were celebrated before 60 years in this particular water body so this is how they have retrieved and they have also created new practices uh, for the current generation so basically from our uh, experience like uh, what we could see is like when community in uh, like community leads the planning process and negotiation process investment and implementation and maintenance and also develop their strategies for cultural expressions then naturally the water bodies are turning into a water commons which are safeguarded for generations that's what our learning is thank you thank you so much ila mohan so um in fact uh, madurai uh, that's a place in tamil nadu and it's one of the 11 smart cities that have been selected and uh, having a discussion on smart cities today and having a real time case study on uh, uh, smart cities and the work that you have done on field like you know rejuvenation of water and it's not a small task na so uh, it's it's very commendable and uh, rts congratulations to that uh so uh, ina mohan would you like to pose questions uh, your queries to the speakers do you have some yeah i have like two yes so one is like uh, since i am working with the community like i have questions for the community like uh, how to work with the education system especially they are like, uh, like uh, how to bring the technology or research from the education system towards this grassroots action okay Thank so you b- b- basically like our associations are trying to uh, like interact with the education system especially with colleges and schools but uh, like there is no any uh, successful model or examples especially after post covid it is very difficult to access the uh, students for being for posting in their uh, water bodies for research and collection of data also so this is one and next is especially the policy on open space research Like what what can be done with the policy on open space reserve because when we like recently when we uh, audited the open space reserve in madurai we could see lot of open space reserves were completely ignored or either encroached or it's just in the data not in the field. so what kind of policy decisions can be done even by the community how we how we can pressurize the government to safeguard this open space reserve so that's it thank you okay thank you so much for your two questions um i think i'll post the first question on how uh, tushar sir uh, i may post the first question to you from uh, ila mohil he asked on how to integrate and how to bring uh, students specifically from the academic forum uh, into such uh, you know in, into such you know uh, social impact making difference on the field so he's asking post covid it's been pretty difficult to get in touch with students at the same time um, academia has also been doing a lot of research work but how do you think the bridge can be established and what kind of uh, uh, incentive is there for uh, the academia as well as uh, the uh, grassroots level workers to work around so would like to know your thoughts on that okay so uh, wonderful this in fact is a wonderful case study uh, you know for academic academicians one of the starting points normally which we face resistance is getting a connect with the community and getting some data for research so so one one thing is for uh, one thing is quite uh, you know uh, easy in this case we have access to data uh, you know the participants are requested to please keep their mic on mute thank you and just that i just said that i am not can someone help me i'm just checking i'm just checking uh, okay uh, just a second tushar sorry for this um you, checking, uh, uh, yogesh can you please mute some of the mic yes ma'am i'm doing I'm, yes ma'am i'm doing that thank you so much huh? okay 
so i think the problem is resolved okay so one of the see one of the industry is always looking so I, i hope i'm audible hello yes you are hello yes tushar you are okay so one of the things you know as as researchers we look for is community connection and uh, data for any research or any you know as uh, writing or any such this thing so here data is available so see for researchers they have what we need the only thing what is missing is probably the connect between uh, the researchers and the community and one of the best cases which i have seen in recent times is opening up competition to international this thing in the international forum because now what is happening is with uh, the 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 advancement of internet uh, you don't need to only focus on the schools or community nearby but this can be a good uh, planning problem or you know uh, uh, urban design problem per se for the entire this thing so i think if we can initiate a competition with uh, the the corporation or the urban local body uh, with community being the anchor of this this can work out uh, also what we can do because i'm uh, so what we can do is uh, we can also so you know uh, over the, so i'm really interested because your day it uh, seems to be quite interesting that this get in is you know while they have uh, these uh, tanks and they have restored the tanks i would in fact like to go ahead with what hari was mentioning in his uh, presentation and model on what is in fact the flood resilience built because of these tank restoration can we look at something like that again uh, you know complete research but uh, because they are working and they already have some data it will be interesting to look at what are the results of this so we as researchers look for data which they have it's just establishing a connect between any institution and with internet this can be open to any any place doesn't have to be restricted to india it can be anywhere so we can hold open competitions here yeah. thank you so much tushar yeah uh, actually ma'am like, yeah, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah actually yeah. like uh, yeah we are posing such platforms but what i mean is like a, a formal a curriculum based connect between the community and uh, the education system that's what i am expecting I'll like i'll be more than happy to connect so i'll be more than happy to connect so yeah so in fact uh, what we uh, so uh, so on another level what we did uh, i'll just tell you what we briefly did in amdad is uh, we took what amdabad did uh, established the case so this is uh, not a case study case study but a case in which uh, we have kept it open so you know this is basically for education uh, yeah, for classroom in which we can take this case and debate what went wrong what is good what is bad so this is like an educate like a harvard business uh, case study and therein i think uh, if we can connect or any institution can connect it might be iiss safe uh, this thing any other theory which can come in and you know uh, probably uh, document your case and you know uh, develop case study material so i don't see why not this this in fact it's quite exciting so i would be happy to document this or you can you know uh, we can connect and we can write uh, so i'll i'll definitely get uh, connected with you on this so i hope that answers yeah yes uh, thank you so much tushar yeah yeah insightful uh, thought and answer i uh, will i'll definitely put you guys in touch with each other and uh, and even hari has given his thoughts on uh, ilamohil even you can check out this eco network that uh, uh, hari sir would you like to elaborate on that also yeah sure uh, actually uh, ilamohil the problem which you have outlined right is like one of the major issues which society globally is facing uh, example science knew all about climate change like 10 20 30 40 years ago but science could not stop climate change right or academy could not stop it so there needs to be a different way in which that science is or like research is engaging into society eco network is one thing which is uh, happening in the indian context i am part of a non profit called initiative for climate action which is part of the eco network but it contains like practitioners and you know like uh some community people and uh, researchers and it's looking for ways to close that loop by taking the knowledge of people like you and constructing the problems which can then be solved by the students 
and they have somebody called like an ambassador who is a postdoctorate student who goes around all these uh, grassroots organizations etc to collect the knowledge and bring back the data access for example to the academia and the feedback i should also mention that it's not a one way process where uh, you know academia is just giving and uh, the communities are just taking the i think there also it needs to be a two way process where knowledge from your communities can go back this way because i think the ivory tower approach is not appropriate for this kind of thing collaboration but happy to discuss further and another thing which i would just tell you which i've seen actually working is when working in these uh, sort of ngos like i was in an ngo where a lot of students were getting masters thesis projects to uh, collect data and do their thing they were coming from all over the world and then they were working like very grassroots kind of thing and uh, it was actually good i worked with somebody from university of cambridge for example very young lady who worked with me on on certain things so it's it's possible if you talk to the right ngos hope that helps thank you so much hari for that and even tushar has shared uh, there are two competitions which worked quite efficiently in two cities so i think elamohil you can get a look at the um, link that has been shared and uh, definitely uh, and yes we have another question from ila mohil that he asked about the policy on how uh, the open space resources uh, reserves uh, in the cities are being currently ignored as in uh, they were once probably part of the lake ecosystem or water bodies or something but now they are not put into that much of effective use so um, uh, hari you have been part of the policy advocacy and you have been uh, uh, writing papers on all these uh, on water and uh, off grid system so would you like to sh sh uh, share your thought and highlight on uh, the open space uh, reserves that are there in cities how are they being underutilized or being ignored or what kind of policy action or initiative must be taken on that i think it's a very good question and you know the answer is not very easy for me to give so it's a very very good question and i think the it boils down for me to something related to design which is who's designing these spaces right but then that's there's one layer below that are these spaces even being designed for and you know like cared for and so on and so forth so uh you know to be honest i don't know the answer because uh i don't know whose responsibility it is to maintain the ecosystem services of public spaces and uh you know how they are you know like let me just get practical if you if you want to do advocacy right the best way to do it is to adopt a multi stakeholder approach if you have just one point of contact in the government and that point of contact gets transferred or you know like uh, stops doing that job or whatever it is then you lose it so the first thing i would say is that every advocacy problem is different and for your problem right you want to have better design and maintenance of public spaces investment into these and for these to be a priority with people who take decisions on how money flows and how priorities are set right you need to first identify who you need to talk to like i would actually go specific i would say this government department this person with this job designation who is filled by this specific person and these job roles and create a map like that so that stakeholder map is really important and i would include everybody in the stakeholder map who is important for your problem not just the government folks but the communities the people who are you know use, using the that those public spaces the people who invested in or co invested in creating you know those cleaned up spaces the uh, you know the 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 all the stakeholders who are involved so that's the map i would create first and then what i would do is i would actually sit down and make a plan where the outcome is to example get five more projects like this uh, within the city within the next 3 years right so i'd make a specific outcome and then i would look at the map and then i would say who do i need to talk to in order to do that and then that's half the problem the other half of the problem is you actually need introductions to these people who will listen to you and you know like hopefully uh, do what you suggest which is an art in itself and all i can say there is uh, you know ias is very important there uh, and and every government official who i have met has been actually different there are people who work specifically with government officials especially in the smart cities 
sort of thing. So if you can catch one of them, then they can give you more information on who you can sort of thing. Like uh, they sometimes specialize on different kinds of issues. So, so I'm not giving you an answer. I'm giving you a process, right? So all I'm saying is advocacy is not an easy task and it requires a long-term outcome-oriented multi-stakeholder approach uh, where you know it, everybody gets on board and it goes through the whole process. And because of that, it's much slower, okay? And, and of course there's politics, but that also has to be factored into the process. So I don't know if I've helped, but I'm just telling you how I would approach it. Yeah, the st stakeholder map identification was a very good point. And definitely even uh, Neha Sarvati also spoke about uh, starting with the development plan level. So um, thanks for that answer. Uh, Hari. So let's take a question from Neha again to Tushar. Uh, Tushar, there's a question that Neha has asked on in urban areas, how does one acquire land or water rights to do civil cultivations? I hope I, I was audible. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So your question uh, was clear. I'm just trying to uh, find out where this question okay. was. Okay. Just, just, just give me one second. Can we... Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, uh, if I understood your question, you're trying to understand uh, how do we uh, give cultivation rights to people for uh, in urban areas? Is that the question? Yeah, or so it's like, yeah, uh, if you can copy paste it, it will be really easy. Absolutely, I'll do that. Okay, this that's how does one acquire land, water rights to do cultivation. Okay, so see, uh, uh, in urban areas, in fact, it's quite interesting to what uh, Hari also mentioned. Stakeholder mapping can be uh, really, uh, it's quite an interesting mix of stakeholders. Uh, so, for example, I'll just give you an example that the land of the lake belongs to the collector, the water or the water quality, somebody, the pollution control board might be looking at, the water might uh, depend, water might belong to the agriculture department, the fisheries in it would, uh, you know, would belong to the, again, it's a very difficult question on, you know, how do you uh, uh, the, uh, uh, give water rights for cultivation. The only problem, the only solution which we have seen working in our case, in at least in Ahmedabad, because we were fortunate uh, on on you know just uh, I'll extend that green cover question. How do you you know take care of these green bodies? What has happened in Ahmedabad is uh, so like somebody said, Neha, I think you only mentioned that there's a DP mechanism, the development plan mechanism. But what Ahmedabad has been able to do apart from DP is uh, implement that DP through a town planning mechanism and therefore carve out some land uh, from the nearby plot, increase the area of the lake in itself, in, in the newer developments at least, and increase the area of the overall lake. So that has been possible. However, uh, this question doesn't still remain uh, uh, answered because, you know, still recently we have been seeing that, you know, Vastra put lake land were transferred recently to the municipal corporation, right? So the area of land always remains an issue. I think will always remain an issue. So it's very difficult. So like Hari said, it's very difficult. Stakeholder mapping is the only way out. And uh, so that's the only way out. And that too, that too has to be done through a DP mechanism, DPTP mechanism. So only that I see as the way out. Uh, Okay. Tushar, Tushar, you may please speak louder. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, no. I was just reading your comment. So, uh, yeah, cultivation is not issue per se. Uh, they might have rights to cultivation, but uh, everything, every other thing in the water belongs to some other person. So, some other department of the government of India. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tushar. Yeah, as you said, uh, um, uh, so as you want to, uh, yes. Uh, so as you said, uh, yeah, it's stakeholder mapping and a lot of people involved because city is, uh, is like a congregation of a lot of uh, entities that work around. And that's definitely true. Like, you know, the land belongs to the collector, the, the PCV and, you know, 
don't a lot of people who are being involved so uh, thanks for that answer and uh, regarding the uh, presentation tusha that you had shared uh, neha did have another question on uh, uh, she asked uh, we did have answers coming but would like to hear from you also uh, the question was where the lakes okay. interconnected through pipelines uh, yes the lakes are interconnected through pipeline so over the years what happened is the lakes in initially the plan was to connect all 22 lakes with uh, the pipeline uh, so the, these are solid pipelines so these are uh, not pipelines per se but uh, square open uh, your box uh, sort of channels which are uh, used here these are closed but these, these were connected through uh, some uh, form of uh, piping system to connect one lake to the other so this, this was connected uh, however so you know like i said so this is quite an interesting case in governance itself because when we started there were 22 now there are 13 and uh, some of these connections are also lost so over the years till 2008 we are uh, in 2018 we again traced these connection lines back so that is the status so they they were connected but now we have lost some of these connections yes thank you so yes. much tushar i yes. i hope Mika, the question has been answered I can see you. I can see your video. If you want, you can. Yeah. Unmute. Yeah. If I can just ask, you know, add on to that is that normally yeah. in these box uh, sections, there's a lot of blockages and obstructions that accumulate over time. You know, in the in the form of probably garbage or some kind of you know situation yeah. that uh, reduces the capacity of these connecting lines. So how does one ensure that the water flows uh, seamlessly from the you know the overflow water? into uh, one over the other and secondly are these pipelines built upon also so at some point it's difficult then uh, you know to trace these pipelines for maintenance as well so these were just two questions that i had so exactly yeah so, so exactly the problem we are facing in Ahmedabad right now that it's very difficult to trace these lines also what has happened is over the years because uh, see one of the things is so therefore governance and uh, institutional framework become very very important what happened is in some of these areas where uh, sewerage lines were still being underlaid uh, being laid uh, there were these interconnections which were already existing so what people tried uh, what a local plumber would do is connect your flats pipeline with the stormwater network and therefore if you see so when i said we started with 22 and there are only 13 inter interconnections existing because in uh, some of these lakes in fact we also took samples of water samples from these lakes in uh, most of the lakes what started happening out of these 22 is sewage water start filling in and therefore these connections were one by one closed so there are only 13 existing connections right now uh, and some of these storm water yeah, box networks have now become part of uh, uh, sewage collection system rather than the storm water which with it started uh, if <clears throat> see if it's if uh, if it's just uh, the sewage so the way it has been planned is uh, the overflow from the lake so it's not the silt which comes with water but the me by mechanism what is happening is these are at a higher level and once the lake gets filled then only this overflow happens so which would prevent in uh, certain cases which will prevent the uh, siltation getting into these box culverts but we had quite a different problem here in Ahmedabad where people started connecting sewage lines instead of silt it was the sewage which uh, closed these pipelines yes Mansi you want to add something I saw your hand raised there yeah, yeah. thank you Aas. Uh, thanks everybody and thanks Vasanta. Uh, I was just going to add because three years ago I also carried out a study with uh, one of my students. We are just about to publish it. Uh, we identified 11 uh, but I just want to bring the focus to smart cities develop project here. So Neha we can discuss it outside this field. None of those uh, pipelines are working and they are oh, sure. so uh, uh, what is important here is to understand that the data of interlinking of lakes was not present and this is where when uh, Sushar and all started working on the project it became extremely difficult. And that's where we can link it to why we have to talk about smart cities uh, from the knowledge management point of view. So I actually brought a student here from Netherlands, Mahek Koteja, who is working on working here 
on the interlinking of lakes in Ahmedabad. I thought she will have some connect with Tushar, so you can connect later. But then uh, when we talk about smart cities and water management, my question uh, act has been actually answered by both the speakers, to be honest. Because one thing is something is happening on the ground, but other thing is how to manage the knowledge so that in future, we can really have a reference line to talk about it, to manage it. And Vasanta, you put it very nicely. Anything that is measurable is manageable, very simple. You know? So we have to first have the measurements or reference line in place. But uh, because I have the platform, I also want to take uh, the advantage of talking about next week's very quickly, a minute, Vasanta. Uh, so please do join us on 22nd of December, where we are having equally interesting session on legal battles of water. And that will be part one. And part two, we are going to have uh, a month later. So when we talk about how water cries are brought to the court and justice is made or not made for water. So thank you and over to you, Vasanta. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Malsi ma'am. And uh, I think even um, Ajit Sheshadri also brought up the point on desilting and dredging. I think that has also been answered uh, in the question by uh, Tushar. So um, now I open the, que uh, 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 question, the podium to the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, you can unmute and uh, ask. Okay, so uh, I think uh, all the questions have been answered. So that's what I see because it's been a very uh, clear, nice session. And uh, yeah, and that's what like water as a clear liquid, right? So <laughs> everything is now in clarity. So um, so Ganesh, sir, would you like to share some thoughts? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed the discussion. I'm very happy that uh, uh, Vasanta's your presentation was really informative and all the speakers also did a great job. I'm glad that this was uh, knowledgeable in both from how technology, where technology play, where technology may not actually play when we have to be very conscious in using technology, technology as a tool, not everything. And yeah, that's I just wanted to mention. Thanks for the wonderful panel discussion. Thank you so much, Ganesh, sir. Uh, Fazia, ma'am, would you like to uh, share your thoughts? Okay, I, I, I think, ma'am, uh, there must be some issue. Okay, thank you. I see uh, Vibhu, sir, also. Uh, uh, Vibhu, sir, if possible. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, thank so, thank uh, you. Uh, wonderful session. I've enjoyed uh, all the discussion and lectures. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Vibhu, sir. So yes, so uh, this concludes our uh, session this week on water management uh, in the, uh, the smart cities. Uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, looking forward to meeting you next week on the legal battles for water, uh, 22nd of December. Um, and yes, I see Fauzia, ma'am. Um, one second. Uh, ma'am, would you like to share your thoughts? I'm so sorry, you know, uh, I dropped out in between and actually my computer just stopped and uh, I just got back. But yes, my thoughts, of course, for the great session. And uh, it was uh, truly amazing. I think uh, uh, very good insights from uh, uh, Dr. Tushar and Hadi and uh, Ella Mohel, especially from the field. I think it was it was great to listen yeah, to them. All the, all the questions that Hari posed, I think uh, we need one session to brainstorm on those questions and find answers to them as well. So they were all very, very insightful. In fact, I'm thinking of using some of those questions in my classes as well to my students uh, to see uh, what, what they feel about it. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks, Vasanta, Thank for this brilliant modera uh, moderation that you did today of the session. I think bang on time. That's, uh, again, you know, uh, probably perhaps a good trait of a brilliant moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you so Dr. much, Fauzia. Fauzia and... yeah, no, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, Dr. Fauzia and Masi and Biba, I should say, Hari is also a musician. And oh, really? He, he, <laughs> yes, yes. He is a amazing. He plays multiple instruments and he also sings. So, we should also invite him for one of the soft 
session sessions my... absolutely absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah. hari is very multilateral and so i i, <laughs> Thanks, I hope Kanish. hari you can engage on few more sessions Sh- sure That's sure I'd be, i'd be very happy to and you know even this discussion of the other questions which were brought up if uh, dr fazia and some of her students want to discuss it on a wednesdays for water kind of thing and of course later on actually work on those problems like uh, in multi stakeholder would be kind of, yeah it would be yeah. really good you know there are uh, there are questions you know often people don't think about them at all so <laughs> perhaps you know we we of course have the recording but maybe if we can yeah. get the slides as well sure, then sure. we can I, use them and uh, we can invite you to moderate that session also okay. yeah i'd love to so i've sent the slides already to vasanta so please yeah, feel free so, yeah thank you thank all you. the speakers are please requested to share the slides either in the pre meeting session or to the modern or the, to vasanta here thank you yeah i'll i'll be sharing it i have the slides with me okay. i'll be sharing okay. it yeah okay. and uh, thanks to ela mohil also uh, for sharing yes. a great insight uh, that was indeed uh, very deep uh, the information that was shared thank you so much ela mohil for uh, the data that you have been able to uh, share with us and uh, thanks uh, hari thanks to shar thanks to the, thanks to the entire uh, wednesday for water team and uh, i see this as the uh, conclusion for the session today uh, let's catch up for another exciting session next week thank you so much thank you presenters for joining us today and enlightening us with your wisdom also thank you all the participants for joining us and making the session interactive besides walking and talking water worries and wisdoms collectively we see this as a platform to cross connect and expand our network and explore possible collaborations we are also making notes to publish both scientific and non scientific work here is a glimpse of some of our writings you may reach us through email linkedin facebook twitter instagram and also look at our website www.w4w.in we look forward to your suggestions and comments to make the series more meaningful and engaging and meanwhile we hope that you appreciate today's session we represent tata institute of social sciences hyderabad terry school of advanced studies new delhi environmental design consultants ahmedabad flux gen sustainable technologies bengaluru counterview and we are supported by ikis water resources council we truly appreciate your support and encouragement in conducting this series and we hope that you will stay tuned with us through our social media platforms and our website and you will write to us at our email ids